Okay. Well, thank you all for coming, and uh, thanks to Dr. Hale from uh, the Writing Center, who invited me to give this talk on how to make a big research and writing project totally manageable. Um, I'll tell you just a little bit about myself, and then preview some of the other talks I'm going to be giving. I'm the associate director of uh, the Great Lives Program here at the University of Mary Washington. And uh, the Great Lives Program, as you may know, uh, brings 18 biographers to campus every spring to talk about their books and to talk about all kinds of different people who have made a mark on, on world culture and world history. Uh, this spring, uh, for example, we're having uh, 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 a uh, graphic artist from New York who's written a graphic biography of Marie and Pierre Curie. We're having uh, Harriet Bryson come talk about uh, Louisa May Alcott. We're having Sid Jacobson, the former editor of Marvel Comics, come to talk about uh, a graphic biography, the first one ever, of Anne Frank. Uh, we're having Mark uh, Liebson talk about Lafayette. Uh, all kinds of fascinating topics and lives for you to hear about as part of the program. Every uh, presentation is at 7 p.m. in Dodd Auditorium, and we'll be posting the schedule in the bullet and around campus, and you're welcome to attend. It's, uh, I'm trying to get more and more students to attend. We have a strong community following, but uh, I'm trying to pitch some of the topics towards students in the hope that it would interest them. This is the first of a series of four talks I'm going to be giving about writing. Uh, I'm going to be giving one today, of course, on how to make a big research project manageable. And then on November 15th, I'm going to be talking about the three C's of writing, clarity, uh, cohesion, and cogency. Uh, I know that sounds kind of high-toned or sophisticated, but all I'm talking about really is, that, as my father, a journalist, used to say, making your writing hang together and making it readable and making the reader want to continue to the next paragraph. On November 8th, I'm going to be talking, or December 6th, sorry, December 6th, I'm going to be talking about writing essay responses on finals, an approach that works. Uh, I remember my feeling of mounting terror when I was writing essay responses in college and realizing that I was somehow off the point or not talking about what I wanted to talk about. The clock was running, here I am writing everything I can possibly think of, filling up page after page and not really feeling in control of what I was writing at all. And of course, when the essay would come back, there'd be comments about, um, well, you, you, lose me, you lost me here, or uh, I think you dropped your second point, things like that. So I developed kind of an art of how to approach the essay because it, it mattered to me. And I maintain a blog, as a matter of fact, that comes out every Saturday. Uh, it's really each, each entry, each post is a kind of essay. On January 13th, or uh, January 31st, I'm going to talk about um, revision. And I know that's something that people don't look forward to, revising their papers. But I have to tell you, the title of this talk is Nobody Runs the Play Perfectly the First Time, Hut to Revision. And it's true. You know, you don't trot out onto the football field or you don't uh, sit down at the piano and open some sheet music and all of a sudden you have a sense of how to do it just right. You know, how to play it perfectly. How to run that, that play so that it absolutely works. And writing is the same way. It's revision. Uh, it's practice, and you'll begin to develop some instincts, but the first real step is to do it over. And I'll be talking about strategies for doing that. A little bit about myself. I'm gonna take this off, I'm a tad warm. A little bit about myself. Why, why do I talk about writing? Why does it interest me? Um, I started taking myself seriously as a writer when I was 15 years old in high school. Uh, I knew I was never going to be captain of the football team. I uh, certainly wasn't going to be the prom queen. Uh, so what could I do that you know, gave me kind of a, a place to be in that school? I started writing for the high school newspaper, and I found that uh, that was my niche. That was something I was good at. Uh, and as I moved through my career, I continued to teach and to write. I taught high school English for 22 years at a large suburban high school near Chicago. I left teaching and I began to write full time. I wrote 20 histories and biographies for young people in grades 9, 10, and 11 because I thought, well, my first audience ought to be the people I know best, which is young people. 
So I wrote books on Spike Lee and um, Amy Tan, George Lucas. I wrote histories like The Great Fire of London, Captain Cook's Discovery of the South Pacific, and many of those books are still in high school libraries today. But I decided to move the bar up for myself. After 20 biographies for young people, I found that it was kind of formulaic. What could I do to make it a little more challenging for myself? What could I do to gain a greater audience? So in 2006, I published uh, Mockingbird, A Portrait of Harper Lee, which is the first biography of the author of To Kill a Mockingbird. It became a New York Times bestseller, I'm glad to say, and led to a career as a full-time writer and biographer. My book coming out in November is the first biography of Kurt Vonnegut. It's called, uh, and so it goes, Kurt Vonnegut, A Life. Vonnegut and I were friends before he passed away, and uh, I spent five years writing that book. So believe me, I know what I, of where I speak when I talk about the, the uh, challenges of research and how to organize your thoughts. I spent pretty much five years sitting in a room looking out the window at the leaves changing, falling off, coming back, changing and falling off, while I wrote this life of Kurt Vonnegut, covered his 14 novels, came up with a 300,000 word manuscript with 1,800 footnotes. So it was quite a challenge, and I went through four drafts, I must say. So what I have to tell you is really based on sort of the school of hard knocks. since what I've learned over the years being a professional writer and being a teacher. All right, I see some of you are taking notes. That's a good idea. I'm going to type some of my thoughts up here, but it's, uh, it relies, it falls to you to get the most out of this, as, as I hope you will in all of your classes. Well, let's say that you have a big project due. And uh, it says on the course requirements that you're going to be responsible for writing a five to seven page paper, or maybe a 10 to 12 page paper, or maybe a 15 page paper. And this weighs heavily on you. You have a feeling of kind of almost of dread if you think about this project that you're going to have to do. Sure, you can do the readings. Sure, you can take the test. But oh, this paper, this paper that's due right before Thanksgiving, this paper that's due right before winter break. You know, it's hanging out there. and Somehow you're going to have to approach it. Well, how long is it going to take you to do it to begin with? I want to apprise you or share with you something that my, my brother-in-law, Gabriel, who's an MBA and does consulting work for all kinds of different companies in Chicago, is something that he calls the 1.5 rule, okay? I can type it up here, too. So the 1.5 rule, and what he means by this is that it's going to take you about one and a half times longer than you thought. So, okay, so if you're thinking that, uh, you know, oh, I'll, I'll put a week in, try 10 days. If you think it's gonna take you two weeks, it's gonna take you three. Uh, this 1.5 rule even applies when, uh, well, when you're asking for a salary. Uh, if you think that you need to make 45,000, ask for 1.5 times that, which would be about 65,000. They may say no, they may say no, but, Use that 1.5 rule when estimating because things always seem to take longer, cost more, involve more effort than you originally estimated. Because after all, you're going to cut yourself some slack. You know, you're going to, in your estimate, you're going to think it won't take as long as all that. Plan for it to take one and a half times more uh, time than you expected. All right, talking about this, um, you know, this big project that you have to do. I want to tell you a little story about my wife and I and a big garden that we planted. And this has to do with a big project, okay? Um, imagine a garden in the back of our yard that was really pretty big. It was about 40 feet by 40 feet. Uh, we were living in the Midwest at that time, and we planted, you know, rows of things, tomatoes and uh, squash and uh, cucumbers and all kinds of wonderful stuff for our vegetable garden. And we planted it sometime in the spring when the weather was nice, around May. And lo and behold, by June, all our sprouts are coming up. And we dutifully went out there, bent and stooped, and you know, weeded the thing. And then the summer heat hit, all right? Starting in about mid-July until mid-August. It was just wicked out there. It was one of those, one of those nasty summers that are humid and hot, you know, unrelentingly. Not the occasional hot day, but day after day of hot weather. 
this past summer was like that, wasn't it? I mean, really, and it wasn't just a you know fluke that we got to 99. It was pretty much the norm. You know, in some days it was 103. Well, the long and the short of it is, is that when we went out to inspect our garden and do a little work in the garden, when the weather finally broke, about the third week of August, it was covered with weeds. You could barely see what was growing between the weeds. And my wife in despair said, I can't possibly weed all that. And we made, we made the garden way too big. I mean, it's, it's nice that all these things are coming up, but I just can't imagine going up and down, up and down, and pulling out all these nasty, noxious, thorny weeds and things. And I suggested something. And it's become the basis of the advice I'm gonna give you about approaching a project. I said, look, let's put a stake right here, okay? And let's attach a piece of string to it, and we'll just weed this today. All right, we'll just weed this portion today. And then tomorrow, we'll move this string, and we'll just weed this portion. And then the next day, we'll move this string, and we'll just weed that portion. Let's make a goal of getting out of here at 8.30 every morning when the grass is still wet with dew and hasn't gotten very hot yet. And you know what? If we do this religiously, I mean regularly, every morning, all this week, do you realize by Friday the garden's going to be all done? And we won't have you know, been out here on a hot afternoon for five and a half hours. We'll be out here for an hour and 15 minutes every morning. We'll be back inside having coffee by 9.30. Okay? So we try it. And this is the basis of what I'm going to tell you. This is sort of the format, the strategy that I'm going to give you for making a research project manageable. All right? Um, let's move the string to the first position right here. And let's call this, this is the first approach you should take. This is, let's call this the focus position, all right? Let me make this a little bit bigger and move it down. Hold on. Okay. All right, focus, key word. Focus is what kind of paper is this? What are you being asked to do? There are three ways of approaching a large paper. Let me tell you about what I call the three T's, okay? The three T's are topic, theme, and thesis. Now, these, oops, topic to hang up there looking like that. These are three different kinds of papers. These are three different, th these words tend to get used interchangeably, okay? What's the topic of your talk? What, what's your theme gonna be on? Um, you know, what thesis are you advancing? People tend to interchange them. I'm going to try and draw a clear distinction between these three things, because it really has to do with the focus of your paper, the focus of your project. And believe me, what I'm telling you is not just for English majors or history majors. It's for whether you know, you're involved in science or you have to do a case study for finance or something like that. Any kind of large project pretty much falls under this rubric. Let me talk about topic versus theme versus thesis. All right, what is a topic? Well, really, a topic is just a topic is just a subject. And um, the good way to think about this, or an efficient way to think about this, is think about an encyclopedic entry. You open to democracy, and it just treats that as a topic. What is it? When was the first evidence of it? Uh, where is it practiced? What are the characteristics of, of democracy? Um, let's say, for example, that you, um, well, let's take some topics. All right, let's take iron. Let's take law. Let's take um, poetry. Let's take light. These are all topics. Iron you might be doing in some aspect of science. Law you're doing in law or government or civics. Poetry you're doing in English. Light you're doing in physics. 
All right, a topic just asks you to do an, an overview. If you're asked to do an overview of a topic, you're really talking about something relatively short and very focused. You know, your approach should be um, just to give information with no bias. And in terms of length, I think topic is certainly the, the shortest thing, the shortest thing to write about. Think encyclopedia when you're thinking about topic. Okay, but let's talk about what a theme is, because that's something different. Okay, a theme is an idea that reoccurs. All right? Just a second. Um, a theme about iron, for example, might be um, iron as a trade good in American Indian societies. And you're not going to spend a lot of time talking about what iron is or where it's found or anything like that. You're going to be talking about iron as a trade good, OK, in American Indian societies. Sorry about the the, the uh, poor spelling here. It's I'm typing in a strange position. Okay. Oh shoot! I'm sorry. Okay. Now you're going to show iron reoccurring. Going to show iron coming up again and again in American Indian societies. Let's take, um, for example, law. All right. What about law as a theme in The Merchant of Venice? You're going to show how law comes up again and again. Um, remember, if you remember the plot of a Merchant, merchant of Venice, uh, a suitor makes a deal with a man that uh, if he doesn't come through on a contract, he will owe that man a pound of flesh. Now, a contract is a legal document, and the play rotates on love and obligation and law, and it's really kind of a long disquisition on obeying the law and um, the difference between law and justice. So when you're thinking about theme, you're really talking about development. You know, you're talking about how something happens and occurs over and over again in something. Um, let's take, um, well, we're talking about poetry. Let's talk about free verse in the King James Bible as a theme. It doesn't occur just once. It occurs a number of times. You'll show examples of it. So. A topic is just an overview. A theme is an idea that reoccurs. And think development when you're thinking about a theme. I think, actually, the easiest kind of paper to write, and you may think it's the most intimidating, is the one that uses a thesis. A thesis is um, a statement or theory you're going to improve. Now, this has an argumentative edge to it. You're no longer just giving an overview. You're not you're just showing how an idea occurs or reoccurs. Now you're talking, now you have an argument, something to prove. And I find that having an edge to something gives you a reason to write. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut at one time said, he could, he could only write the best things when he had a real ax to grind, when he had a chip on his shoulder, when he had a point he needed to make, a criticism he wanted to get across, when he wanted to satirize something for its nonsense or its, its lack of character or something like that. But he found that the tightest writing that he did, the best writing, the funniest writing, was when he was trying to show you something, try to prove something to you as a reader. Um, let's try a couple of thesis statements with our topics, all right? Let's get back to iron again. How about um, iron 
revolutionized, okay, How about iron revolutionized agriculture in Europe? Oh yeah? Prove it. Show me. Wasn't bronze good enough for making plows? Wasn't bronze good enough for making hoes? Why is iron superior? Here's a thesis statement um, about um, free verse in Psalms. All right, how about um, free verse was an invention of the translator in 1380, all right? That it was, it never happened before that. That, that John Wycliffe, when he translated the Bible in 1380, created free verse. And some of your research will show that the Hebrews didn't write free verse. Aramaic-speaking Greeks didn't write free verse. John Wycliffe in 1380 thought that the Psalms would be more powerful in free verse and he created it. Until then, it never existed. And it's the forerunner of free verse today. If you open up the New Yorker, you'll see free verse. It goes all the way back to Psalms in 1380. So a topic is just an overview. Think encyclopedia entry. A uh, theme is a, recurring, is a recurring idea over and over again. Think development. And when you come to a thesis, think argument. That's really the key. You're gonna try and prove something when you make an argument. I think, as I said, that creating an argument or creating a thesis statement is really the most powerful way to give your paper or your project some focus, some direction. It's incumbent upon you now to show something, to show the reader how something works. All right, now, let's go to the next thing. Let's move the string. Let's move this string and continue on our way with our paper. Let's move it to this point. Now we've got this area to do. In this area, let's talk about your research. Research, I think, can be exciting. When I tell people I'm a biographer and they ask me what that's like, I say, you know what? It's like being a literary detective. Like being a literary detective. You find out information. Sometimes you find out really fascinating things you didn't expect. Uh, didn't expect this, for example. When I was at the Hull Library at the University of Alabama, I was going through the papers of a creative writing teacher at the University of Alabama. And I had hoped that Harper Lee had him as an instructor. And I thought, who knows? Maybe some of her early student papers are in with her instructor's papers. Didn't find anything about Harper Lee. She's really kind of swept the floor clean when it comes to leaving clues by herself. But I did find a mysterious looking folder at the back of the professor's papers. It said Civil War. All right, oh, okay, the Civil War, what about it? I'll bite, Harriet, or Harper Lee's great grandfather was in the Civil War, who knows, maybe it was in there. I pull out the folder and I find a letter and it's to the professor, years ago in the 1950s. Dear professor, my husband was a Civil War buff, and knowing how much you enjoy the Civil War, I thought you might like to have this. I found this in his belongings after, it, after he passed away. So I open the folder a little bit wider, and there's a little like playing card in there. And I take out the card, and I look at it. It's a picture of a very handsome man with a cane. Very good looking man from the 19th century. He was leaning over like this, and at the bottom he had written in his own handwriting, John Wilkes Booth. It was a card that in the 19th century people left when they called on people or came to parties. People collected, they were like business cards. This was John Wilkes Booth calling card in his own handwriting that he had left at a party in Washington. It was sitting in a file. I went up to the, the uh, librarian and I said, I think you should put this place, this, you know, put this away somewhere. And he said, yeah, I didn't realize it was there. I said, anybody could walk away with it. Out of curiosity, I went online to the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago, which deals with Civil War memorabilia. And I said, um, I just found a calling card by John Wilkes Booth. Any idea how much it's worth? I just so I can tell the museum guy or the you know, librarian? And he said, well, they're pretty rare because, you know, he died before he was 30. He was 
shot to death here in Virginia, of course, by Union troops, escaping from the assassination. He said, well, he died at 27. We haven't seen many of those. I'd say minimum $15,000, probably. Maybe as high as 25 if it's in good condition. I said, it's in mint condition. He said, well, 25. So when you do research, all kinds of fascinating things turn up. You find just the right point you're trying to make. You find somebody who supports your argument. I find research really kind of exciting. Now, I want to emphasize something when you're doing research. Okay, I want to emphasize the importance of variety. In other words, you should be looking at books and reports and lectures online. How many of you have ever gone to iTunes U? Have you gone to iTunes? Isn't it amazing? There's 500 colleges and universities that are posting their lectures online. If you're an English major, I highly recommend you watch Amy Hungerford take apart American Lit from Yale. Amy Hungerford's lectures are marvelous. She treats Jack Kerouac, she treats Cormac McCarthy, Thomas Pynchon, you know, class by class. They're entertaining, they're insightful, you can hear the students' questions. Avail yourself of not only the education here at the University of Mary Washington, but, but you know, what you can learn from other universities and classes as well. iTunes U, U is a marvelous research. How many of you are familiar with TED? What lectures? What cutting edge stuff? And they're searchable by topic, whether it's robotics or sociology or politics or feminism. Do a topic search in TED and treat yourself to a rehearsed, professional level presentation by a really creative minded person, by a very interesting person. I've never been disappointed by them. And of course, there's online interviews too. Google your topic. See if you can find somebody give, being interviewed on Book TV about it or CNN or, uh, this is a really a wonderful phenomenon, all the people on YouTube who just like to teach. I mean, YouTube started out with people training the camera on their kid for 15 minutes, right? You know, or, you know, here's the shot out my window, look at those snowdrifts, that's great. But now YouTube has evolved into a much higher level and you know when I buy a new piece of software or something like that? Uh, yeah, there's the directions. But what I find very helpful is I go to YouTube and I key in WordPress and I watch like, you know, half a dozen people demonstrate WordPress to me. Or I key in um, something I want to learn about, anything I want to learn about. And I find that people give talks and demonstrations using YouTube. Okay, um, there's also, of course, uh, journals and uh, government documents and audio AV materials. The reason I bring this up is I don't want you to rely too much on just one thing. It's important to get variety, and I'll give you a reason in just a second, two reasons, as a matter of fact. When I was in college, I did what I thought was a real bang up job on a paper about James Joyce. I was 18 years old, I was an English major, and I was writing this paper on James Joyce. And um, I had never used Ibid before. I thought that was very sophisticated, you know. Ibid in the footnotes, okay? So I had like 25 footnotes, and I'd say about 18 of them were Ibid. Right. Uh, Ibid this book, Ibid this book. So I get back the paper out and I get a low grade. And I asked the instructor what went wrong. He said, well, you relied, for, you relied on three books for a seven page paper. You know, you kept, what you pretty much did was you just parroted back what you found in three books. I'm looking for more sources than that. I'm looking for more opinion than that. Well, okay, fine, where do you get all this? You are at a tremendous advantage being here at UMW and being the age that you are. Um, your instructors will tell you that when we used to do research back in the 60s and the 70s, we went into the library, ripped through the card catalog, and then spent the day wandering through the stacks looking for just the right journal, just the right book. And sometimes they would limit how many times you were, how many things you could take out, how many items. 
So your hunt resulted in seven things, but you could only check out five things a day because somebody else might want to use it. So back to your dormitory, you go and you go through the five things and you bring them back, get the two that you need and find that one, one's been checked out in the meantime. And you sort of lost that race. But look at the advantage that you have. Look at all the wonderful things that you have to avail yourself of. Go to the site for the UMW library. It's one of the best things I've seen. You're, you're with Jack Bales, the, the head librarian, has done a marvelous job of creating a page where it's all there for you. Um, how to use databases, how to do a journal search, how to cite sources. You're not alone. This wonderful page will guide you topic by topic through any questions you might have. And it's really a marvelous thing to use. So make sure that you go to the UM Library homepage and have a look. Everything is arranged there by topic. And you can do a tremendous amount of research just from your computer. Let me give you a, a reason why you want variety. Right? First of all, I mentioned that um, you want different sources. Right? But what's the reason why? What you want to do is you want to immerse yourself in all kinds of different opinions and different ways of coming at a paper or a research project. You don't want to just parrot back what you hear from a few sources. You want to be able to, well, let's go to something that all of you education majors will come across eventually, which is Bloom's taxonomy. Okay, and it, this is how your brain works too when it comes to learning information. How many of you are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy? Okay, all right, talk about Bloom, just briefly. Bloom has levels. Some of you teachers in here might correct me if I'm wrong. At this level, you're just getting the info. At this level, you tend to memorize. You can parrot it back. Okay? At this level, you know it well enough that you can analyze it. Maybe you start to have opinions. And this is the highest level. Ta-da! This is called synthesis. This is when you can actually begin to get creative and original. Here, you're just being introduced to the info. Here, you know a lot about the topic. Here, you begin to realize that some people are more informed than others about this topic and have a better understanding. <coughs> and here is where you get to synthesis where you can really start to create based on what you know. So if you have a lot of different sources, and if you immerse yourself in them, you'll move up through Bloom. But the best thing is you'll make room for your subconscious. Your subconscious has a lot to do with creating things. Your subconscious is just sort of wanders over the terrain as you're talking to someone else, as you're sleeping, as you're typing a letter. Subconscious thoughts bubble up because some area of your brain wordlessly is thinking about that. Um, it's where some of the most original ideas come from. When you immerse yourself in a topic, when you take a lot of information from a lot of different regions and resources, <coughs> in your brain, you let them percolate in there. You let those ideas cook, all right? You may not be consciously thinking about it, but subconsciously, these ideas come forward. Give your subconscious room to work. Now, what does this mean that you won't be able to do? You can't cram. You really can't do all this in a short space of time. That's why I'm using, that's why I mentioned the 1.5 rule. Longer than you expected. People will say things like, oh, I, I do my best work under pressure. You know, I, I like a deadline. It forces me to get in there. You're gonna remain pretty much down here in terms of understanding 
if you laden yourself with a lot of raw information, sort of get to know where to find it, but you'll never move up to the point where you're really thinking about it. It's all you can do to just absorb it. It's all you can do to just become familiar with it. You can't play with it. You can't take a new twist. You can't take a new direction. Give yourself time to move up to the point where you can synthesize all this information, critique it, and come up with some thoughts of your own. Otherwise, you're doing what's pretty much the equivalent of a sixth grade book report. If you lay in yourself with a lot of information and then lay it all out on a long paper with no analysis, no combining of ideas, you're doing a, a, the essence of a book report in the sense of, well, this is what the book is about, and uh, here's what happened in the book, and here's what I liked, and here's what I didn't like. Okay, you're not writing about Flicka, you're not writing about Misty of Chincoteague, but you are, you know, in college writing about George Washington, and you could fall into the book report trap by just talking about who he was, when he lived, what he did, and what you admired about him, and your professor gives you a low grade because. We know that. I could have gotten that from the encyclopedia. That's the topic level. You want to get into the proving things level, or at least into the theme level. So give your subconscious time to work. All right? Now, one other tip I want to have as you, as you go, as you find these resources, keep your bibliography. Keep your bibliography as you go. And you know what a bibliography looks like, right? A bibliography is, um, I'm sure you've had this in, all the way in high school, for heaven's sake. You know, it's the author and the text and the publisher, right? And the author, and it's all in alphabetical order. And you may think, oh, okay, I'll do that at the end. That's like the wrap up, right? Do it now. Do the bibliography as you go. It will lay the foundation for the rest of your work. In other words, you'll be able to refer back to it when you take notes and things. This will be your key. This is your, um, this is your code for finding your way through all of the sources. Keep your bibliography as you go, not at the end. I mean, case in point. You check out a bunch of stuff from the library, and yeah, you take notes on it, and then you return to the library, and then you realize, I'm not sure what page that was on. Oh, we already returned it. Okay, or I don't know, I don't know what the title of that book was. Keep your bibliography as you go. I'll show you how it plays out later, too. All right, also, here's something you is worth doing on a computer. As you get all this research, set up your folders. Set up your folders as you go. What I mean here is this. All right, let's say let's do the Merchant of Venice. How are you going to set up your folders for the Merchant of Venice? Your, your thesis is about um, law versus justice in the Merchant of Venice. All right, your big folder is Merchant of Venice. Inside it is when it was written. And inside of that are two smaller files, historical background and plot summary. And um, here's some information on the characters, and here's some information on the conflict. So let me flesh this out a little bit. This is the big one. This is your paper, the Merchant of Venice. OK, this is when it was written. This is the historical background. Okay, this is the plot, this is characters. Smaller and smaller as you set up your files and your file folders. The big thing is Merchant of Venice. Underneath it, underneath it is a folder when it was written. Underneath that or in that folder when it was written is the historical background, the plot, and then even smaller, maybe a a file on character than a file on conflict. Is this format, does it resemble something? Does it remind you of another, another way of, another format in writing? Your outline. Your outline. By creating these folders and breaking them down, you're starting the rudiments of an outline. 
So here you are building your house, building your project, so to speak. You've got your bibliography. These are all your sources as you're going. Now you're breaking down information that you find logically, and it's creating the rudiments of an outline. Step by step, step by step, it's starting to come together, okay? Let me give you one more tip about using research and things as you find things. Whenever possible, grab or copy the digital file. Okay, scan it, or download it, or copy and paste. Why? Because you can use the search topic, you can use the search function on your computer, or if you have a Macintosh, the spotlight function, to find things throughout your scanned documents. Sometimes you'll remember a phrase, but you can't find it in your folders. In what folder did I put that? And if you're doing a really big project, like an honors thesis or something, you could have dozens of these folders. Where did I see that he lived in London on Threadneedle Street? Uh, it's minor, but I want to mention it. You can you look in historical? and you look in plot, and that, use the search function on your computer and put in thread needle, put in London. If everything's scanned, if everything's digital, your computer will do the walking. Let me tell you how this benefited me when I was doing the Kurt Vonnegut book. Kurt told me shortly before he died that he had no letters. He lost them in a fire. The fire in his study um, on um, the Super Bowl day, January 2000, Kurt was by himself up in his study, and Kurt loved to smoke. Kurt smoked Pall Malls all the time. So he left a cigarette burning on his desk, went downstairs to get a cheese sandwich. As he's getting milk and stuff out of the refrigerator, somebody starts pounding on the door. Mr. Monaghan, Mr. Monaghan, there's smoke coming out of the third floor. He runs up the stairs. The cigarette had fallen into a waste basket, lit all the paper on fire, and now the couch is on fire. And this is a relatively small room. They went in there and they start dumping out, you know, people don't know how to fight fires unless they're professionals. He dumps out of, you know, the paper and now it's going everywhere, embers and sparks, and it lit the bed on fire. Vonnegut was in the hospital for six weeks for smoke inhalation, trying to fight that fire. When the firemen showed up, firemen do what firemen need to do. All over the study, poked a hole in the ceiling to allow the stuff to vent up. What happened was he lost all of his letters. Kurt died, and I thought I didn't have any letters from him. Over the course of the next three years, I interviewed about 125 of his friends, John Irving, John Casey, Gail Godwin, all kinds of people that he knew through his writing life or from having been a teacher. He wrote such good letters that they kept them, and they shared them. At the end of three years, I had 1,500 Kurt Vonnegut letters that he didn't know existed. Copies of them. Laboriously, over a month's time, I scanned all of these letters, one at a time, okay? Came out to notebooks, two-inch notebooks, about, well, about three feet, three feet of two-inch notebooks by decade, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. I had papers all the way from when he was released from his POW camp in 1945, up to two weeks before he died in February 2007, because he loved to write letters and I had them. What did all this scanning do for me? Well, first of all, I could, I could drop and drag <laughs> into my outline. I could find good phrases and things like that and just add them to my outline electronically. But also by using search, I found patterns. I inspired my own thinking. For example, I put in death into spotlight. Does Vonnegut talk about death very much? I found out that in one of his novels, the word death occurs, on average, every three pages. 
You just go right past it. You know, you think, oh, you know, and then, then the death of her, and this will be the death of me. And uh, when death approaches, he talked about death a lot. And the older he got, the more he talked about death. Kurt hated getting older. He yearned for his boyhood. Only by using a search capability, you know, could you notice these kinds of things. You can run your own experiment on all of your stuff. How often is slave, how often is the word slave mentioned in this diary? Um, how many years did he actually live in London? You can create by using your search capability. You can create a deep chronology. You know, look, look up all the dates. Just put in 19, see what pops up. Put in 1950, see what pops up. Put in 1955, see what pops up. And here's your computer helping you. You have an unpaid research assistant tooling through all of your stuff, looking for dates, looking for names, looking for the word love, looking for chemistry, looking for quantum, whatever you want to find. The computer will find it for you. You have, in essence, on your machine a miniature library that's searchable. The more you add to your library, the more the computer builds up its mental muscles and finds all kinds of things. So I would encourage you to scan, download, copy, and paste whenever you can, and put it into your file folders, and you're creating a deeper and more nuanced and richer outline as you go. All right? Now, let's get to the dreaded outlining. I say dreaded because people don't want to do it. But I have to tell you that if I, personally, if I didn't outline, I'd be lost. I just be lost. No, you can't write something really big without a blueprint, without some kind of plan. It's just it's too overwhelming. So outlining is a, is a really key thing. How many of you use Microsoft Word? There's a no-brainer for you. Aha, but how many of you have availed yourself of the outlining format under view? One, two, three, four. Okay, not many. Use that powerful engine, use Word. Word allows you to outline. You highlight everything, okay? And you hit outline. And you're gonna say, oh wait, it didn't come out right. That's not, I don't want that to be an A or a B. Move it, move it over, okay? Create your own outline or do this. Interested in some free software? Google. I did this last night just in an experiment. Free outlining software, okay? The first hit will be Gizmo. On that site are six free outlining programs. Three for PCs, three for Macs. Free software, and they do different things. They're not just clones of each other. Uh, you know, Roman numeral, Roman numeral. Some do different things. One keeps all of your folders in the margin on the left, and you drag into your outline. Another one allows you to bump topics to the right, and as you bump them further over, the uh, numerical uh, quality changes. In other words, if you bump a capital A over, it becomes a one. If you bump it further, it becomes a small a. If you bump it further, it becomes two, you know, Roman small letters. It's, it's remarkable. So use the outlining function, okay? Um, and you'll notice that your, fo your folders, if you, you know, if you build them as you go, your folders suggest a natural outline. You picked up on that already. <clears throat> I'm not saying this will be a perfect outline, but it's the rudiments. You have to start somewhere. The key to building anything large is starting out small, and this becomes an outline, and the outline becomes the basis of your paper or of your project. Now, as you put things into your outline, danger, danger. Watch out for plagiarism, okay? And watch out for poor spelling. <laughs> okay, what is plagiarism? I took it right off the UMW website. Plagiarism is the taking of someone else's ideas, thoughts, theories, concepts, 
words phrasing your facts as if they were your own, stealing their intellectual property. Now I know that young people your age are exposed to the idea that information should be free. Songs, <clears throat> books, all kinds of things should be free. But understand that behind those great ideas and behind those facts are whole careers that you know musicians have spent their life creating or authors have spent their life writing. And when you appropriate it and give no credit, or you say that, no, that belongs to me, I thought of that, I'm really brilliant. You're taking their effort and calling it your own. You, you might as well, you know, go through a museum, take the paintings off the wall, tuck them under your arm, and trot out the door, go out to the sidewalk and say, how do you like it? You know, I, Mona Lisa, I did it. Give credit where credit is due, all right? Don't take intellectual property. How do you avoid, how do you avoid, um, plagiarizing. Well, either rewrite in the outline. In other words, as you put things in the outline, rewrite them right then. Or rewrite from the outline. What I mean is, either for the first stage, you rewrite when you put the stuff in, or at the second stage, when you take the stuff out, you rewrite it. But pass it through a couple of filters. Pass it through a couple of filters, a couple of rewrites as you go. Otherwise, you'll be very tempted just to be sloppy and pick whole things right up out of your outline that you copied and pasted from a book, drop them into your paper, and you'll be guilty of plagiarism. So put them through a couple of rewrite filters, okay? Extra insurance is to do both. Rewrite things as you put them into the outline and rewrite them when you take them out of the outline. And by that time, you're two removes away from the original source. Always use footnotes. Always use footnotes when, for two reasons. I shouldn't say in two reasons, two circumstances. A professor told me this in college and it's always stood me in good stead. Use footnotes or endnotes, okay, for anything controversial, like your reader's gonna go, really? Are you sure? Footnote it. The other reason for footnoting or using endnotes, endnotes go at the end of the paper, obviously, is any concept not your own. Footnote it. Say, yeah, it's a great idea, but it doesn't have to be mine. You don't lose anything by footnoting. It's not a confession that you don't know what you're doing. It's not, a, you, know, it's not you saying, I'm not bright enough to think of this. No. Um, all, all creative types in the sciences or whatever know that they stand on the shoulders of other people and that they adapt to ideas. So footnote, any idea or concept not your own. I think I mentioned this when I first started out. My the latest book on Vonnegut, the book I wrote on Vonnegut, has 1,800 footnotes in it. There's sometimes there's nine footnotes on a page. Um, I don't think it interferes with the reading. If anything, it just makes it look like, you know, I really, really built this on a solid foundation. I didn't try to claim that it's all original. My ideas about him and his writing come from other people. Now, speaking of writing, what about getting down to the actual stage of writing? Okay, what you should do is you should attend Mr. Shields' talk on November 11th, which is um, the three C's. All right, the three C's of writing. Clarity, cohesion, and cogency. Being clear, making things hang together, and making a point. I really can't tell you in a short space of time how to write your paper per se. I want to devote an entire talk to that in itself, writing, all right? Some tips though, some tips about writing that you can, these are takeaways that you can use all the time. Use track changes. How many of you use track changes on Word? Okay, make a note, it's very useful. What track changes al allow you to do is this. Track changes is what editors use and professional writers. Okay, you write a sentence. Um, any cat 
Ken Singh. And you read that over and you realize, wait, there's other things that can sing. Track changes will allow you to put a line through cat, and right next to it, there'll be in red whatever you type in. Any mammal can sing. Now, when you're writing a long paper, if you use track changes, you can see what you've done as you go. Instead of throwing out really good sentences or phrases and then thinking, no, I think it was better the other way, but I already hit the lead. Track changes shows all the fooling around that you've done all the way through your paper. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes you'll realize, it's not mammal, I want to say. Put a line through that, and you add another one. Whatever, OK? The original will be in black, and the changes will be in red, blue, or green. And then at the end, you hit accept changes. All of your changes suddenly become part of the document. And here you are. It's all done. But don't lose the thread of what you were thinking about. Don't lose the thread of your composition by constantly deleting, 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 and then realizing, you know, I think it was better a couple of days ago. Or this paragraph is really weak, but what was I talking about? Use track changes. Second idea about writing that you can take away. Leave your paper away from you somewhere for a day or two and let it just cook. Get defamiliarize yourself with your paper. Defamiliarize yourself with it and then go back and read it and you'll see how to make it better instantly. It's really surprising how soon we forget. You create something, you put it aside and then you come back and you see, oh, I, I forgot to you add something or you take something out. But let it cook on its own. Then come back to it. Your 1.5 rule will stand you in good stead. By allowing more time than you thought to do it, you really will be able to put it aside for a couple of days. Don't look at it. No peeking. Come back early in the morning, read it, and you'll see, I know how to make this better right now. Also, maybe your subconscious will have been working on it. Last thing about improving your writing, and I want to emphasize this. Read your writing aloud. Virginia Woolf said, good writing reads like good conversation. What she meant was that writing is not a lot different from speech. Have you ever had the sensation of reading a really good book and it's as if the author were talking to you? When Harper Lee's Kill a Mockingbird came out, what really struck her friends was it sounded just like her. It sounded just like her. That's the way she tells stories. When you read To Kill a Mockingbird, oh, Boo Radley, you know, and the fire across the street and everything, that's Harper Lee talking on the page. You want your writing to sound like a good conversation between you and the writer. In fact, that, that style, that ability to get across a presence on the page is called voice. And you want to develop a voice. You don't want your paper to read like a washing machine manual, real dry, you know, and very all declarative sentences. You want it to have a human quality about it. And you can find that human quality by reading your stuff aloud. You'll know a sentence is too long when you have to take a breath in the middle of the sentence. You should be able to read a complete sentence without taking a breath. If you have to take another breath, it's too long, and your reader will lose the thread of what you're talking about. And if as you read aloud, it ceases to make sense to you, what am I talking about here? The reader's not going to know. If, as you say it out loud, it becomes complicated or it rambles, your reader's going to say, this is rambling. Read it aloud. It really makes a difference. OK? And the last thing, when you get your paper done, let's go to evaluation. Okay, last thing. Handing in your paper is not the end. It's not the terminus. You may think, okay, done, fine, hooray, let's celebrate. Let's go get something to drink. I'm done with that awful paper. Actually, get as much mileage out of all your work as you can. Listen, you've jumped through a lot of hoops to come here. 
You took the SAT, you took the ACT, you made it all through high school. You, some of you college graduates, you made it through college as well. Those of you who are undergraduates here, you might be here on student loans, you might be working a part-time job. Ring this place for all of the learning and education you can possibly get. Don't just hand in the paper, get it back and say, hmm, C plus, in the drawer it goes. Or worse, you throw it away. Get the most you can out of an evaluation of your work by doing this. Make an appointment to see your instructor. Okay, and go over the paper. You gave me a B. How could I have improved it? You wrote in the margin here, um, you wrote, this is light. What did you mean by this is light? Okay, not, not deep enough, I didn't talk enough, um, help me out here. This is, this is what part of your education involves, being proactive, um, taking away as much as you can from the, what your instructors are trying to give you. Make an appointment to see your instructor, bring the finished paper in and ask, how can I improve this, what was good, what was bad? And keep all your papers. Okay, they are a, they're a record of your learning. You'd be surprised how these papers might come into play later. After all, you're majoring in a particular field. If you keep all of these papers, they become your, your own private file of thoughts and fresh ideas and, and thinking. And some of those papers may turn out to be a good report in the business world, or a good article. I'll tell you a true story. A friend of mine named Debbie Applegate was at uh, college 15 years ago. Got real interested in a preacher, Henry Ward Beecher. All right? Henry Ward Beecher was a fiery abolitionist preacher, almost forgotten to history. She started investigating his life very influential man in his day. Thousands of people came out to hear Beecher talk. Then there was a serious scandal in his life, a romance that he didn't want to admit to, and he fell from grace, and the abolitionist movement was deeply hurt because after all, all the, all the pro-slavery people could say, there's your hero, there's your moral voice, there's your man who took the moral high ground, you know? He's a fake, he's a fraud. He, she thought his life was fascinating. She did a major paper on Henry Ward Beecher. When she went to graduate school, she continued to do research on Beecher, turned that into her doctoral thesis. The Life of Henry Ward Beecher came out as a book in 2007 and won the Pulitzer Prize for Biography. It started out as an undergraduate paper on an almost forgotten anti-abolitionist preacher and ended up winning the Pulitzer Prize. She just, it was the beginning of something for her. It was the beginning of a, uh, an understanding of herself and American history. Keep your papers, don't throw them away. It's a great archive of your own thoughts that you're building. Now, I wanna stop here, I'm a little bit over, and I know some of you, you know, have your own priorities and your own things that you have to do. But ask me questions. Anything that I've brought up so far, anything I've brought up in the course of this that you'd like to you know, elaborate on. Yes. Um, you were talking about immersing yourself in your work, and the problem, especially as an undergraduate, is that you simply don't have the time mm -hmm. when you have four papers and three tests and all the lectures to go to. It's true. Um, and, yeah. But that you know that doesn't lessen your need or want to write a good paper. Right. Um, how do you well, balance that. Um, how to juggle things? Huh. I, can, I can only give you here. I'll give you what I do. Okay. I make lists. All right. I make lists of things, and I designate some things as a priorities. These are things that have to be done. B priorities. It would be nice if I could get to them. Okay. 
and see priorities uh, tomorrow. But I know I gotta do them. Okay? As I scratch off my A priorities, I must do them today. The B priorities become the A of the following day. I just, I promote them. The A's are what I must do now. And the B's are what I'd like to do now. Boy, if I could do them today, that'd be great. And the C's, I'll get to them when I do. I'll get to them, but I know I gotta do them. As I scratch off the A's, the A's become B's and the C's become B's. And eventually, things just get promoted up through urgency. From I'll do it Wednesday to I'll do it Tuesday afternoon to I'll do it Tuesday evening, now I must. So I keep lists and I prioritize in terms of what I should be doing. And a good question to ask yourself, and it's a tough one to answer, a good question to ask yourself is, what's the best use of my time right now? And sometimes you won't like the answer. It's not sitting here having a Coke. It's not sitting on the bench listening to my iPod, is it? <laughs> well, I mean, you wanna get it done? You wanna get through your tasks? Ask yourself, what's the best use of my time right now? You won't turn into a Puritan. You won't be a little doobie. You know, you'll just get your stuff done. Other questions? Yes. Um, you're talking about like using academic databases and stuff like that. Yes. And I'm kind of thinking about if I want to do research after I get out of school. A lot of the databases are free for us, but you kind of have to sign up for later. So, what are good databases that you don't have to spend too much, but you can still do some nice research? Questia, Q U E S T I A. Questia has a fabulous number of journals and articles online. And don't overlook, free to everyone, Google Books, where you get to peek into out of print books in the world's great libraries and find things. And we're fortunate to live in Virginia. I don't know whether you're aware of this, but the University of Virginia, because you are a resident of Virginia, allows you to use their databases on site. So if you go to the, if you go to the Alderman Library at the University of Virginia, for example, and just show your driver's license to show that you live in Virginia, go over to a computer, and all their million dollar databases are open to you. You don't have to be a student to use them. So I recommend Questia, it's absolutely, and um, there's also one called, um, I think it's called uh, Spotlight. I think it's called Spotlight. But in any event, they're becoming more common. They're becoming more common. You subscribe, about $59. Other questions? Anything else? Yes? Is your um, next talk going to be like the same time, place? Yeah, Gwen, we're going to have it right here, aren't we? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and I promise you, now that I, now that I know the AV set up in here, uh, I really thought I was gonna have like a, a grease board and a chalkboard, you know, old fashioned style. But now that I see that we have this, I guarantee you I won't be typing out my notes up there. I'm gonna be using a PowerPoint presentation. Other remarks? Oh good, okay, thank you.